This is this is this is an, an anomaly. I'm hitting record and Satan is not in here. Where can you find good snap-on ferrite beads? Should you use one long run of coax or maybe break it up into smaller sections? Name brand versus Chinese antenna tuners? And what is your antenna tuner actually doing? Spoiler alert, it's not doing anything to tune your antenna. Coming up this time on Mailbag Monday. What is happening, everyone? Thanks for tuning in to Ham Radio 2. My name is Mike K8MRD. If you have amateur radio-related questions for me, shoot me an email. I would love to hear from you. K8MRD at iCloud.com. We've got four things to talk about, so let's dive right in. This first viewer writes, Hi, Mike. Thanks you all the good you do for us hams. You're welcome. I want to put snap-on ferrite beads on some RG8X. What type of bead do I need? I've been reading where you... Uh, I've been reading where you're told to use 31 mix, yes. They are hard to find. Are they though? Also, what size should the inside diameter be? These will be used on HF vertical antennas. Well, would you believe, good viewer, I just happened to be in the Dallas area last weekend and I stopped by the Ham Radio outlet in Plano, Texas. And I had no intention of spending any money there. I just wanted to stop in and take a look around because I've never been there. Then I saw these. These are ferrite snap-on chokes, mix 31, and this is a 10 pack, and it was about 50 bucks. So ham radio outlet. These are made by Palomar Engineers. You can also go to Palomar Engineers website, I'm sure, and find these as well. But ham radio outlet. It doesn't get any easier than going on the internet and ordering them. So what this is, I, I'm having a little bit of RF coming from my radio to my computer. So I'm like, I need some good chokes. I have chokes, but I don't know where they came from. Like I know some came from MFJ. I know some came from like probably Amazon. These I know are mix 31 and you get a variety pack. Inside here were 10, I've taken a couple out. But you have a uh, quarter inch, what do they say? Four three eighths inch diameter, four half inch diameter, and four, uh, excuse me, two three quarter inside diameter. So to answer your question in the most basic form, the 3 8 inch, which is this, fits just perfectly over RG8X coax. But sometimes we need more than one ferrite on there. So would you rather pay a bunch of money to have a bunch of the same size ferrite on here? Or you can use, here's the half inch diameter and helpful tip there with a Sharpie, I labeled them P31 so Palomar Mix 31, just so I know I don't get them mixed up with my other chokes, so I know that these are the actual good ones. Here's the uh, half inch diameter, and we can put three turns, maybe. It worked before. Maybe I lied to you. Two turns <laughs> in one bead. So we're getting twice as much choking just by having a larger diameter uh, bead. And then conversely, with the three quarter inch, this one will work. We have three turns in there now. So we're getting three times the choking, basically, with one ferrite. And I thought this was really cool to have this kit here because you can use these for all kinds of things, not just your coax. Like when I tune up on, when I key up on 40 meters FT8 and my stereo in the living room is on, oh boy, does she hear it. So I need to put some of these chokes on some of the speaker wire. But this, this box also came with this great two-sided um, kind of article, if you will, telling you what the different mixes do. So like mix 31 is good for one megahertz all the way to 300 megahertz. So pretty much all the frequencies we're concerned about uh, in terms of RFI and ham radio, but different mixes do different things for different frequencies. So. Really cool read, talks about choking out like wall warts and stereos and home appliances and stuff. Really cool, so 50 bucks, you get 10 chokes of three different sizes from Palomar Engineers. That is my answer. I'll leave a link in the description. But call HRO if you have questions or call Palomar Engineers, but uh, that's the short and skinny of it. Ham Radio Outlet, Palomar Engineers Ferrite Chokes. There you go. 
Next, we got a question about coax length. This viewer writes, hi, Mike, looking for your opinion on coax length and future replacement. If you have a long coax run from 150 to 200 feet, would you get that exact length or break it up? 200 feet, would you break it up to like a 100 foot run and 250 foot runs? My thing is when it comes time to replace it, for whatever reason, it might be easier to isolate the bad section and just replace that section instead of doing the whole 200 feet. Yes, I understand that every connection of coax, there will be loss, but thinking about the maintenance side of this. So I am on the complete opposite end of the spectrum as you are. I'm not personally too worried about insertion loss. loss. Jim Heath, Whiskey Six, Lima Golf has done countless videos the insertion loss is very, very minimal. My concern with using multiple runs of coax to get to that 200 feet is every time you're doing that, you're increasing the odds of having a fault and not necessarily an electrical fault, but just a problem at those connections. If I have one 200 foot run, for example, of coax starting in the shack and going to the antenna, there's really very limited chances of anything going wrong. My biggest concern would be water ingress, whether it's direct burial or not, however you have the coax mounted or, or run, doesn't really matter. I mean, your coax just kind of sits there. So long as it's UV rated, if it's out in the sun or direct burial, if you're gonna bury it, um, shouldn't be a big deal. Now there are times where critters can get in it and gnaw at your coax. Um, so that could be a concern. But I would be more concerned about actually making sure my connections in between the runs was waterproof. And how do you test for that? You really can't. Sure, you can put amalgamate, self-amalgamating tape around it and electrical tape and all kinds of things, but how do you really test is it really waterproof other than dunking it in water and possibly ruining the coax? By having one length of coax, that becomes a non-issue. Finding a fault in coax is not hard. If you have a 200 foot run of coax and somehow it develops a short, like a, like a gopher chot, chomped into it, you can use an antenna analyzer. I think most of the rig expert analyzers have, and, and other analyzers, have a uh, TDR, time domain reflectometer in it. I know my rig expert stick pro does where you enter in the velocity factor. I think you might enter in the length of the coax. I don't, I, I'm not 100%. It's been a while since I've done it, but velocity factor for sure. And it just shoots a signal into the coax and through the algorithms inside of it, it knows where that fault is. And most coax has um, labeling on the coax as to like how far in it is. Um, you know, there's measurements usually stamped on coax except as I look at this tram coax, doesn't look like it's on it, but either way, you should be able to find it with an antenna analyzer. So 100% uh, I would go a one full run of coax. I would not wanna deal with the potential of water ingress. Water's the worst thing for coax. And by having multiple connectors in there in line, even, even though you've tried to seal them up as best you can, there's, there's always that what if. So that's my opinion. What say you guys in the comments? Next, we've got a question about antenna tuners. This viewer writes, have a question on automatic antenna tuners. Is there an echo in here? <laughs> I'm looking for a good antenna tuner for the IC7300 I just bought. Congrats on the new radio. I run a house in an HOA neighborhood. Dun, 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 dun. And either work out of my backyard or POTA on the weekends. I normally run a G90 with either the JPC-12 or the Chameleon SS25. Of course, the G90's tuner is outstanding. Now I've upgraded the 7300. I'll still use the SS25 and the JPC12, mostly due to lack of trees high enough to run a long wire. For field day this year, and when camping up north, I'd like to run one of the G5 RVs that I own. Nice. I've tried using a G5 RV this weekend, and the SWR was off enough that I needed an external tuner. That is because the G5 RV is meant to not be resonant on any of the bands. So I was looking at the LDG AT200 Pro. <laughs> I like the fact that it has two SO239s for two antennas and that it works 1.8 to 54 megahertz, 100 watt single sideband. It's 200 watts. Uh, I don't mind spending the money on quality gear that I can also use once I get a house and have the ability to put up several different antennas. There are a lot of ATU on eBay running for about 75 to 80 bucks that would do the same thing. Will they? Minus the second SO239. So would you recommend any of these cheaper ATUs or should I stick with the name brand proven ATU? Thanks for your help in 73. 100% 
stick with the name brand. Um, so I don't have a lot of experience with LDG specifically, but I have used them. They're fantastic. They have support. I talk to the reps at every single ham fest I go to. We exchange cigars. They're good people. And the tuners actually work. And they're sold everywhere by all the major ham radio uh, distributors. I have um, a Chinese tuner. This is the ATU-10 on my 818. And I got this, I think one of the Chinese like AliExpress or something sent this to me years ago. And I reviewed it and I didn't give it a very good review. Since then, there has been a firmware update that some guy just came up with, had nothing to do with the company that makes this or whoever it is. Uh, but there was a firmware update that I put on it. Don't ask me where I got it. Don't ask me how to do it. I don't remember. I'm amazed that I even could do it because it wasn't easy for K and MRD, but I did it. And the tuner still doesn't tune as well as I would expect it to. I, I use a nine to one. Oh, there's Satan for this radio that K6ARK made me. And some of the bands, it's like, eh, not so much. The name brand tuner is 100% going to be better for you. Buy once, cry once. That LDG AT200 is like 300 bucks versus like 100 bucks that you're going to get on Amazon. Uh, you going to get any support? or on eBay, you gonna get any support from that company? You gonna get any warranty? No, I, I would guarantee, if you did, I would be shocked. Uh, get the LDG 100%. I or if you can find a uh, an MFJ, like I have the 993 Bravo here in the shack that I, ha I don't really use it, but I have it. Um, doesn't go up to six meters though, but uh, MFJ tuners, if you can find one that's in good shape uh, used, 100% I will stand by uh, MFJ tuners. I, I own three of them. They're fantastic. Three different models. They're fantastic. So, uh, but LDG is kind of the name to go to for tuners. I have spoken. Do you want to say anything, Satan? No? Okay. See, now it's time in the video when I need to do stuff on the desk and Satan knows that. That's why he's here. So we'll, we'll wait. Okay. Satan, I really, really need to use... And lastly, we have another question about antenna tuners and SWR. Let's take a look. So this viewer writes, Hi Mike, I've been following your channel for a while and recently joined. Thanks for the membership and really appreciate the troubleshooting insights you provide. I'm hoping you can help me out with a weird SWR issue I've been experiencing. Here's my setup. ICOM 7300 LDG AT100 Pro. See, he's got an LDG. A Daiwa meter and a Chameleon 80 to 10 and fed halfway about 33 feet up. When I add the CN901, that's the Daiwa uh, SWR meter, into the mix, I notice something strange. My ICOM 7300 and LDG tuner both display similar SWR and power readings, but the CN901 meter shows drastically different SWR values. From what I understand, the last device in the chain before the antenna should give the most accurate reading, but the difference is so big, I don't know which reading to trust. So sort of, depends on how you have it. If your antenna tuner is the last thing in, in the chain, you're not going to see a difference if you put your SWR meter before the tuner. So we'll explain in a second. It says, additionally, I'm losing 5 to 10 watts of output except on 20 meters. So my question is, which SWR reading should I trust? Should I rely on the CN901 since it's closest to the antenna or go with the best two out of three? <laughs> hey, two out of three ain't bad, you know? And is there a way to verify which one is correct? I'd love to hear your thoughts and if possible, see a video explanation on your channel. So let's show you what's going on here. So here I have my ICOM 7610 that is going directly into this MFJ watt meter and directly out to the antenna. I, I do have an antenna tuner in the shack. It's not hooked up. I don't really use it because I don't really need to. Uh, so we're going to take a look at 30, mega, uh, 30 meters or 10 megahertz, which my antenna isn't really resonant on. It's an 80 meter end fed half wave. Shout out to 10 antennas. So uh, right now the tuner is off. The radio is set to 100 watts. And let's key up on CW and take a look. So here we can see my SWR from what the radio says, little over three to one, we're putting out about 50 watts. But the watt meter that is the last thing before the antenna is showing 2.8-ish uh, standing wave ratio, okay? Now, if I engage the tuner, watch what happens. Now my radio is putting out 100 watts, 
My SWR is non-existent on the radio, but we still have 2.8 VSWR on the meter. And the radio is actually only putting out 100 watts, but we have 25 watts of reflected power that's getting reflected from the antenna back down the coax and back out and back down and back out and back in and back out and back in. So the antenna tuner is doing nothing to tune the antenna. It is a misnomer. All the antenna tuner is doing is, is matching an impedance that is not 50 ohms and making it 50 ohms so your radio is happy. You're right, my radio folded back its power to 50 watts because it was seeing a three to one SWR, so it's not frying itself. But once we engage that tuner, now we've done some impedance matching and the radio is just fine putting out that 100 watts. Doesn't mean my antenna is all of a sudden like better on 30 meters because it's tuned. It's not tuned. The only way that my antenna is going to be tuned is if I take it down and cut it to make it resonant on 10 megahertz. That's it. Antenna, the word antenna tuner is kind of a misnomer. It's, it's really an antenna matching unit is, is all it is. So I had another comment about this um, since last week's video and, you know, People love their tuners. That's great. They have their place in life. If you've got a broken antenna or something or an emergency, a tuner is certainly going to help get you on the air because your radio is happier. But all of that power is still not being radiated because the antenna is not resonant on 30 meters. Does it work? Yes, 100%. Does it work as well as other bands where it's actually resonant? Like for example, if I go to 17 meters, tuners off, key up, 1.25 to one SWR on the meter, nothing on the radio, it's just resonant. Don't ask me how I got 17 meters <laughs> resonant on a 40 meter end fed half wave. I just somehow did, but it's totally resonant there. So yeah, um, that's why I'm so uh, fanatic about resonant antennas. You don't need a tuner. I know what the antenna is doing because I have an antenna analyzer and I just use the, the, the built-in tuner on the 7610 if I, if I need to sweeten up like 30 meters or um, you know maybe 12 meters, that's about it. So your Daiwa meter is reading properly. Every, everything in your system is reading properly because you have the radio going into the tuner and then the tuner's going into your meter and then the meter's going to your antenna. So your radio and your antenna tuner are matched to make it look like your antenna is resonant at that frequency. Your SWR watt meter, your Daiwa meter, is showing you what your antenna is actually doing, if that makes sense. If you put that watt meter before or in between your radio and your tuner, your watt meter would show you the same thing as what your your uh, antenna tuner and radio would see. You'd see like 1.0 to 1 SWR. So that's kind of a little misleading. I would keep it the way you have it because that's like a last point of failure. If something were to happen, say you're running FT8 at 100 watts on an NFED and your toroid starts to get saturated. Well, you can tune that out to a degree and it would look like everything is good when in all reality, if you don't know what your antenna is actually doing, uh, if you don't have that dial a meter right before your antenna, you're, you're just always gonna think everything is good. You're never gonna see any problems. So I would keep it the way you have it and know what your antenna is actually doing. I don't care what my watt meter says in terms of like SWR, I, I mean, I do, I wanna know, like if my SWR just all of a sudden spiked to 10 to one or, or higher, I'd know there's a problem. But if I had a tuner before that, that might kinda hide it. Does that make sense? So that's my answer. Tuners are good, but, but they ain't all they're cracked up to be. That's just my opinion. What say you? Anyway, that's all we got for today. I'm rambling long enough, but I'm glad that Satan was finally able to grace us with his presence. So my name is Mike. If you have amateur radio related questions for me, shoot me an email, k8mrd at icloud.com. And until next time, we will see you again on another episode of Ham Radio Tube. 73, y'all.